uh, it's eight o'clock. Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to today's episode of Marvelous Medicine. It's on lifestyle medicine. Uh, the speaker is Dr. George Ampert. He's a consultant orthopedic surgeon and a clinical teacher at Liverpool, UK, and he's also the medical consultant to Atrix Worldwide. Dr. George uh, did his MBBS from Jipma Pondicherry, MS Orthopedics from PJ Chandigarh, FRCS and Orthopedic Rotation from Oxford Deanery, and Spine Fellowship from Queen's Medical Center, Nottingham, UK. Uh, George is also the lead of the musculoskeletal special interest group of the British Society of Lifestyle Medicine and the College of Medicine. He takes particular uh, interest in finding non-surgical solutions for bone and joint pain and prevention of injury. Uh, George has authored many self-help books, is keenly involved in research and has published in peer-reviewed PubMed index journals. Uh, thank you, George, for uh, readily accepting to uh, talk on this uh, topic. Uh, those who are regular in marvelous medicine would have already heard his talk. Vidya, we can't see you though. Vidya? You can't? Okay. I, 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 your video is not on. Okay. No, I can see Vidya. We can see. I think I can also see. Oh, I can yeah. also see. Okay. I can also see, yeah. All right. Yeah. So, uh, I, anyway, the spotlight doesn't have to be on me. So, so thank you. No, but George, there may for, be two uh, with, with yes, there may be two with you. I think you're logged in yeah. both on your phone. Yes, yes. I am having some problems with the audio of my laptop. So, I'm logged in through the iPad as well for the audio. As so joining us today will be Dr. Akila Ravit Mar. She's a senior consultant in wellness with Newbuck Diagnostics and a dental practitioner and diabetologist in Chennai. Dr. Akila did her MBBS from Tanjore Medical College, MPhil in Hospital Administration from Bitspilani, Diploma in Diabetology from Anamalai University, and is now uh, pursuing a, a Diploma in Medical Law. Her areas of interest are diabetes prevention, for which she provides counseling, conducts camps, gives awareness talks in person and through electronic media. Akila is passionate about elderly care and is one of the rare senior doctors in Chennai who does home visits for the elderly. Well, Akila is a regular follower of uh, Marvelous Medicine and a well-wisher for the series. Welcome, Akila. Uh, officially, first time on board. Thank you, Vidya. Now, last but not the least is Dr. Vijay Bose. He's a joint director and a senior consultant orthopedic surgeon, Sims Hospital, Vadapani, Chennai. Dr. Vijay Bose did his MBBS from Madras Medical College, MS Orthopedics from Mangalore, MCH Orthopedics from Liverpool, Fellowship in Trauma and Orthopedic Surgery from Birmingham. Dr. Vijay provides a referral-based service for complex hip, knee, and shoulder problems. He has delivered numerous guest lectures in various international conferences and has performed live surgical demonstrations in hip, knee, and shoulder surgeries all over Asia. Other than operative orthopedics, he has a special interest in health and fitness, into which he has delved deeply. Dr. Bose delivered a series of three lectures on, the, uh, on health and fitness for marvelous medicine, and uh, the a record for the total number of attendees for any marvelous uh, medicine session still is held by uh, Dr. Vijay Bose. Thank you, Dr. Bose, for uh, coming in again. Over to you, George. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vidya and uh, Patta. And my, you know, I am always amazed uh, by the energy that Vidya and uh, Patta have for organizing this every week, weekend, you know, uh, they don't seem to have a rest or holiday. So uh, it's just amazing. Your energy is, you know, I wish I had even one tenth of the energy that Vidya has, you know, uh, she's amazing. Just awesome. Uh, out of this world. Anyway, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. So I'm going to just discuss uh, on lifestyle medicine. As uh, Vidya said, I am an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, I'm slightly old. I'm 60 years. So I don't, uh, I do some surgeries, but not a lot of surgeries now. I'm more into trying to help people without surgical intervention because I personally feel the pendulum has swung too much. And uh, we are, you know, patients can, patient can come and I give three tablets in the morning, three tablets in the afternoon, three tablets in the evening. And then who benefits, the sufferer of pain or the shareholder of the company that makes the tablets? You don't know. So, you know, you have to really question whether, you know, these tablets are necessary and whether these in interventions, even surgical interventions are necessary. Uh, even in the US, uh, you know, 4% of the world's population live in the United States, but 44% of the world's tablets are being consumed in the United States. Uh, you know, some company CEO was meant to, was saying that, uh, you know, we need to give out these tablets like Smarties. We want people to take these Smarties. You know, that's when they make the profit. So are they really trying to make people healthier 
or are we our attempt is um, trying to make profits for the company so it is something a debatable topic so that is where lifestyle medicine comes because in the end all of you are amazing human beings i mean you have been created by millions of years of research you are not just been created today you have been created by millions of years of research so it is evolutionary advantage has come into you over a period of time we have become better now just because i went to medical school for 5 years and i've done operations for 30 years doesn't make me superior to mother nature mother nature or religion or whatever you think god whichever has created an amazing human being and we have gained so much of advantage over the period of time so we cannot disregard that and that can make and as voltaire said nearly about 400 years ago he was a french philosopher the creative art of medicine is the ability to entertain patients while nature cures the disease so are we actually are we just watching when nature does the job you know so let's me start the talk enough of my rant before the talk so let me share my screen so i'm very happy for people to uh, stop me uh, i'm very happy for people to stop me in the middle and uh, ask me questions because uh, you know uh, if uh, sometimes we may not remember and towards the end if there is a question time i'm quite happy to do then also but we tend to always ask questions on the last 10 minutes of the talk rather than the first 30 minutes of the talk so in the middle please, uh, please feel free to stop and uh, interrupt me and ask any questions so as i so, uh, George, as, if I, if you don't mind i would uh, we give enough our usp for marvelous medicine is that we provide enough time for uh, uh, questions i would request uh, the audience to uh, whatever questions come to their mind or uh, comments come to the mind please enter them into the chat box as and when they come to you uh, but we'd like to address them all towards the end because uh, we have enough time we, you uh, okay. half the time is for discussion so uh, there is no worry every question will be addressed and every comment will be taken gracefully so uh, okay, fine. Uh, i would prefer that they don't interrupt your talk sure okay fine okay yeah yeah you're the moderator we have to listen to you yeah <laughs> good okay so i am i work in liverpool in uh, uh, aintree university hospital i'm also the clinical teacher in the school of medicine at liverpool university i work for an american company that makes orthotics and i have my own uh, small uh, you know uh, clinic in southport in mersey side so this is what happened if you look at the global mm -hmm. burden of disease and the we were being killed by communicable diseases but in the early 1990s that statistic completely changed from communicable diseases being the biggest killer non communicable diseases became the biggest killer so it was no more the bugs the bacteria the viruses or the fungi that were killing us it was non communicable diseases that was killing us so our strategy needed to be changed but as our strategy changes the real quest and even the world health organization says that non communicable diseases so in 2019 that is prior to the pandemic non communicable diseases 41 million deaths out of the 55 million global deaths and not alone that premature non communicable diseases according to who premature death is any death before the age of 70 but in western countries they consider 75 as the age of death so any death before the age of 75 is considered premature but according to who be about you know prior to the age of 70 if you die it is a premature non communicable disease and 47% of the deaths prior to the age of 70 is from non communicable diseases so it's from heart attack stroke everything are from you know the causes of death this is if you see over the last you know 120 years or 116 years mm -hmm. the light blue at the top the turquoise blue is the infectious and parasitic diseases mm -hmm. and you can see that the contribution of death by them decreases over a period of time whereas the other diseases like cancer cardiovascular diseases neurological diseases are on the increase and is that because we are not doing lifestyle medicine so and we are still focused on the leading causes of death not on the actual causes of death so this is the statistics from the uh, centers of uh, disease and uh, control and prevention cdc and you can see the biggest cause the leading cause of death is heart disease cancer and then covid-19 this was during nine, you know last few years in 2021 statistic 
but there is an actual statistic called actual cause of death. I know this is slightly an older paper, but the actual cause of death, it's not just why you die, but why are you really dying? And tobacco is the biggest killer, 400,000, poor diet and physical inactivity, 300,000, alcohol consumption, 100,000. So these are preventable actual deaths that can occur. So there are three things here. One is avoidable deaths. So according in the Western countries, avoidable deaths are defined as either a preventable or treatable death for those under the age of 75. Among avoidable deaths, there are two groups. There is a preventable death and a treatable death. A preventable mortality is that which can be prevented through public health or primary prevention. Whereas a treatable is you find and secondary care involved is involved and then a death is further prevented. So the ideal option is to create or to treat the person or prevent or develop wellness so that we can have, we can decrease the preventable mortality. That should be our aim because we are always thinking on the spectrum of illness. We need to be thinking on the spectrum of wellness because after all, we are doctors. We are not just making people who are ill better. We are also making people prevent them from becoming ill. That is the important thing. Now, if you look at UK, this is the uh, official figure uh, uh, by the National Office of Statistics. And you can see in 2019, I've taken this because it is prior to the pandemic. And these are the different countries within UK, England, Scotland, Wales, and Greater Britain. And this, we are talking of the uh, avoidable, avoidable mortality rate. So less than the age of 75 people who have died in England, the rate is 220 per 100,000 people. Scotland is 307 plus 100,000 people. So it is quite a significant amount of avoidable deaths are still occurring. That is premature deaths. And how can we change? Now, till, as I said, till the 1990s, we were fighting with the antigens. And we knew how to fight vaccinations, antibiotics. We were able to fight with the antigens that invaded us. But now we have to fight a new enemy. It's not called antigen, it's called anthropogens. So the, we are now fighting with this anthropot man has created. Now, when you look at anthropogens, what's the definition of anthropogen? An anthropogen is defined as a man-made environment. They are byproducts or lifestyles encouraged by those environments, some of which have biological effects, which may be detrimental to human health. Now, the idea of you know lifestyle medicine came initially from Dan Butner. Dan Butner is a National Geographic uh, journalist, and he traveled the world and he found that there were five areas in the world where there were maximum number of centenarians. That is, people who were more than the age of hundred and they lived healthily. So people were living to a ripe old age, hundred and plus, and the ten times more centenarians than rest of the world. And he identified these five places. Okinawa in Japan, Ikeria in Greece, Sardinia in Italy, and Nicoya in Costa Rica, and also Loma Linda in California. Now you will say all these are islands and that is why they have you know, isolated communities. That's why they're able to live 100 plus more, but that's not really true. Loma Linda is in California. Now Loma Linda is, you know, you can understand it is a very uh, close community there. There are Seventh-day Adventists, and the Seventh-day Adventists control everything in Loma Linda. Uh, Lo, uh, Seventh-day Adventists are a group of Christians. So because they are, they are so much control, even the uh, National Post was not delivered on a Saturday. It was delivered on a Sunday because their Sabbath was Saturday. So, so much the church controls. But being a religious community, they're very close-knit, quite a lot of support from each other. And that is important. We are now becoming more and more nuclear. The importance of family, the importance of counseling between family members, that, those are the things that give us longevity. But that has been lost in the nuclear setup or what we call as Western or modern type of living. So the traditional type of living was better. And that is what many of these communities have. So there is a lot of family support, psychological support that is important. Now, let us when you know, it's important that we talk about our checkout. Now, when I say checkout, I'm not asking, uh, talking about checkout from Hilton or from Sheraton. I'm talking of checkout from Hotel Earth. All of us are mortal. All of us will die one day. 
you know, you will die, I will die. So let us look at how we check out of Hotel Earth. So we are temporary residents in Hotel Earth. So just to, I know it's not a true story, but to drive home a point, I have a fictional story. So we are looking at the checkout of two people. One is Susanna, the other one is Sakura. So we'll see how they check out. So that way you can understand what a British checkout looks like and what a Japanese checkout looks like. So Susanna is a civil servant. She retired at the age of 65. As soon as she retired, her social circle contracted. Well, she was involved in a lot of communication in the morning from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. and the evening from 4 p.m. to 10 p.m. There was a black box in a lounge that was talking to her, but that was only a one-way communication. At the 60, she breaks her wrist, 70, she breaks her back, 80, she breaks her hip, and then she has dementia at 81. She's in a nursing home, resident of a nursing home for five years. She's demented, and then she passes away at 86. That is the British checkout. Now, let's look at the Japanese checkout. Sakura, she's now 96. She never stopped working. She's still working. She does some traditional knitting and sells it to the local supermarket, which sells them on. So she's still making money. She teaches mathematics to two of her great grandchildren. She exercises with her mates in the park between 6 p.m. and 8 p.m. And at the age of 96, she passes away in her sleep. Is there anything in the chat that I need to see? Uh, do I need to follow the chat? I don't need to follow the chat, I presume. Vidya, do I need to follow the chat? No. Not right not, now. Not, not required. Okay, okay, yeah. So what is the definition of lifestyle medicine? This gives a very good definition of lifestyle medicine. So lifestyle medicine has been defined as the evidence-based practice of assisting individuals and families to adopt and sustain behaviors that can improve health and quality of life. That is lifestyle medicine. So if I look at the, you know, the commonality and the differences between conventional medicine and lifestyle medicine, I know it's a slightly busy slide, but this gives us the difference between conventional medicine and lifestyle medicine. So conventional medicine initially focuses on risk factors and proximal determines immediately what is going to happen for the disease. That is all conventional medicine is involved. You have an acute cardiac event. How do you, uh, do you put a stent? What are the anticoagulants you give? That is what the immediate focus. Whereas lifestyle uh, for medicine focuses on the medium term and on the distal determinants, on so the long term, what happens to the disease. In a conventional medicine, you're a passive recipient. The doctor tells you this, this, this are the re requirements is your prescription. But that's not in lifestyle medicine. In lifestyle medicine, patient is an active partner in the care. In conventional medicine, patient is not required to make big changes. He has to just take the tablets. Whereas in lifestyle medicine, the patient has to make big changes. The conventional medicine treatment is short term. Antibiotics for a course of seven days, fine. But here, the treatment is almost lifelong, long term treatment. In conventional medicine, emphasis on diagnosis and prescription, whereas here, emphasis on motivation and compliance. And in conventional, less emphasis on environment, whereas lifestyle, greater consideration of the environment. And here it involves medical specialities. You know, you see a cardiologist, cardiothoracic surgeon, neurologist, neurosurgeon, whereas there's a lot of allied health input, you know, social prescribers, game, people who teach you how to play, that, all that is important. Then here in conventional medicine, doctor generally acts as independently, whereas here doctor is a coordinator of a health team. So that's, those are the differences between conventional medicine and lifestyle medicine. So, what are the six pillars of lifestyle medicine? The six pillars of lifestyle medicine are these. Daily physical activity, restorative sleep, healthy eating, decreased stress, positive attitudes, avoid substance abuse. And those are the six pillars of healthy lifestyle, you know, lifestyle medicine. So let's look at each one of them. Let's look at daily physical activity. Now, are we doing... The government prescribes we need to be doing 150 minutes of moderate 
intensity physical activity per week and that is very important because what has happened is now we have become couch potatoes you know when in the younger days if you had to get a partner you had to ask your wife to get up and dance along with you but now i understand you can easily get a partner by swiping on the phone left or right you don't even need to get up and have a dance so we have become inactivity we have become inactive so that is you know and that is causing a lot of disease so we need to have physical activity moderate physical activity and according to the uk sorry i have to just move this for a minute in the uk we need to do at least 150 minutes of moderate physical act intensity every week or 75 minutes of vigorous intense activity a week and what is moderate physical activity so moderate you can measure your moderate by in the sense that you will be able to talk but you will not be able to sing in a mild act intensity you can sing and talk in a moderate you can talk but can't sing in an extreme or more severe uh, physical activity you can neither sing nor talk so vigorous intensity you can neither sing nor talk so we want 150 minutes of moderate or 75 minutes of vigorous intensity so taking a walk like this with your little uh, you know puppy may not be moderate physical activity so it should be a strenuous fast quick brisk walk that will increase your heart rate where you can talk but cannot sing and that is important unfortunately a lot of my patients and i do not know whether your patients once they become seniors they sit watching television there is a direct link between the hours that you sit and watch television and you know have dementia because it is such a passive activity and unfortunately even watching television actually increases the hormones that are secreted you see a fearful screen on the you know scene on the screen your hormones increase yes that is a fight and fight response but in actual reality if you were actually faced with the tiger you will need to run away but now you're just sitting on a couch and having that same hormone release for fight and flight and that is actually being detrimental suddenly glucose level increases because the body is anticipating you to run away from the you know from the fight or in the fight or flight uh, response but actually you're not running away you're just watching a tv it is just a fearful so tv is quite you know harmful and we don't recognize that next is restorative sleep we need to sleep well we need to feel refreshed but unfortunately the stresses that are occupying the present modern day world we are not able to sleep well at all people are tossing in bed so what we go through a cycle we go through a 90 to 120 minute cycle every there are multiple cycles of the same cycle we go multiple times in a sleep so there is stage 1 stage 2 stage 3 and the last one is a rem sleep and we need to go through the cycle that is when we are able to the new cells are being renewed and become become energized for the next day but otherwise if you don't go through the cycle and your sleep is disturbed you're not energized you're not refreshed and actually next day you're going to have more problems so sleep is very white so if we have to sleep we have to prepare they say you have to prepare 6 hours before you sleep and you really need an alarm too to go to sleep just like how we an alarm to wake up you need an alarm this is the time i need to go to bed it is an habit that we need to unfortunately this has changed because we have a pineal gland and the pineal gland secretes melatonin or the sleep hormone now the pineal gland is stimulated by light when the light enters our eyes goes through the optic nerve and the optic chiasma some light sensation goes to the pineal gland and suppresses the melatonin so unfortunately in olden times when we didn't when we lived for centuries without electricity and light there would be darkness and as soon as the darkness you would secrete melatonin from the pineal gland and we would go to sleep but unfortunately with artificial light we can keep awake you know the whole night and there is stimulation to the pineal gland and that is why we go into this wrong cycle so what are the things that we can do to improve our sleep you need to stop drinking caffeine or, uh, you know at least 6 hours before the you know before you plan to go to bed you need to stop drinking alcohol and finish eating dinner at least 3 hours you need to finish exercising at least 2 hours you need to turn off all electronics stop working even the screen you shouldn't see the screen for an hour and then you need to go to sleep and you need to go to sleep at a particular time so if it is 10 o'clock at night every night like an alarm clock you need to go to bed so a perfect night sleep starts much before you actually go to bed healthy eating 
Now, unfortunately, all our food, majority of our food is now coming out of a packet. Now, I, I do not know the superstores in India, but here, if you make bread at home, the bread, you know, if you make at home, it lasts only for a day. After a day, it becomes moldy. But you buy bread from one of the supermarkets, it lasts you for seven days or 10 days. How does it last so much? Because they put a lot of preservatives in that. So this is what God gives. And this is what we need to eat. But this is what man gives with a lot of preservatives added. And that is detrimental. It is not the ingredients. It is the preservatives that are added. It's not the meat in it or the peas that is a problem. It is a, a, the ingredients that they add to make preserve these for having a longer shelf life. That is what is detrimental. You need to, we need to always be protecting the gut and, you know, feeding the gut and protecting the liver. We are not doing that if we use processed foods. And there is also this myth, there is a myth that, you know, you can get only proteins from animal uh, food, but that is not true. You know, meat is not the only thing. You look at all these land animals, large land animals, they don't go to McDonald's and have a burger to get their strength. They are actually, you know, vegetarians and eat, you know, only plant-based material and they are very strong. So it's not, it's a myth that you, by eating plant-based, you will not be strong. There is a pyramid in plant-based also, like there are high, you know, uh, nutrients and low nutrients or low high calorie. So like nuts and oil, grains, pasta, high calorie, low calories are vegetables. Vegetables. And vegetables are important because that gives us the fiber. Fiber is very important. In other words, fiber is so important that you can say if you have a big poop, you will have small hospitals. Whereas if you have a small poop, then you're likely to have uh, uh, big hospitals. Uh, sorry, my internet uh, got my... You just need to turn on your video, Dutch. That's all. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, one minute. Yeah. You can keep speaking, uh, John. Yeah. We can hear you. Yeah. Sorry. One second. One second. One second. Yeah. 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 I know. I know. Sorry. Just give me one second. Yeah, I should hopefully correct it by the end. I don't know what has happened. Yeah. Okay, sorry. So small, big poop, small hospital, small poop, big hospitals. So next coming to decrease stress, that is chronic inflammation. Now, how do we decrease stress? There's chronic inflammation is known to cause brain fog, inflammation, autoimmune diseases, fatigue, pain, it affects our diet. Now, there is no direct link from chronic inflammation and diseases, but we have some indirect link. And this is the difference between acute inflammation and systemic chronic inflammation. So in an acute inflammation, you have PAMS, and in chronic inflammation, you have more of DAMS. That is, PAMS means pathogen-associated molecular pattern. This is all cell signaling. So pathogen-associated molecular patterns is more in an acute inflammation when there is an infection, whereas systemic chronic inflammation that's where there is a chronic for a long time. That is where your exposome, exposome is whatever you're exposed to during a lifetime. It could be preservatives. It could be radiation. It could be different things that you're exposed to or chemicals in the water, you know, different things that you're exposed to that is causing the problem. So, and whether in acute inflammation is only short term, whereas the other one is long term and it's low grade. And unfortunately, there is no systemic markers that we can identify systemic chronic inflammation, whereas acute inflammation, it is easy to mark them. So I'll just skip this. We just went through that. And these are the causes and the effect. So in the causes of chronic inflammation is chronic infections, decreased physical inactive or physical inactivity, obesity, dysbiosis, our diet, uh, the uh, sorry, the uh, isolation and chronic stress, disturbed sleep, xenobiotics. These are different, you know, pesticides or even antibiotics given to animals which are there in our foodstuff. And the effect of that is you get metabolic syndrome, you get cardiovascular diseases, uh, cancer, depression, 
the autoimmune diseases, neurodegenerative condition, sarcopenia and osteoporosis, and immunosenescence. These are the consequences of the, you know, because of chronic inflammation that we have. Now, how inflammation helps, let me, these are the indirect, you know, uh, evidence about how inflammation can be detrimental. This is a, a, a randomized controlled trial about kanakinabab with regards to myocardial infarction and cardiovascular events. So here, kanakinabab is an interleukin 1b, uh, it stops that. And they have found that it decreases cardiovascular events. So what we know is inflammation. This is independent of the lipid lowering. So lipids can cause cardiovascular events, but kanakinibab, which is an anti-inflammatory therapy, can also decrease. So I'm just giving you some evidence of how anti-inflammation or decreasing inflammation can actually save our lives. Here again, this was a test done on rheumatoid arthritis. People who had rheumatoid arthritis have an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. But people in rheumatoid arthritis who were given TNF-alpha inhibitor etanercept had less Alzheimer's than the others who were not given etanercept. So there is some connection. So again, it's the inflammation. The etanercept decreases the inflammation and by decreasing the inflammation, they, there was less you know, Alzheimer's in that particular group. So this is all what happens in a chronic inflammation and the gut microbiome is involved. So as I said earlier, big poop, less inflammation because there's a lot of fiber because when you don't have that fiber different you know uh, molecules or you know molecular mimicry different uh, substances enter our gut we have a leaky gut and when you have a leaky gut there are more things for us the immune system to fight and that initiates the immune response that initiates a chronic inflammation so it is important that we are you know, feeding the gut properly with actually what good vegetables rather than artificially prepared, you know, uh, things which are detrimental to health and which can actually damage our liver. So coming to positive relationships, I said earlier about how we are living in, you know, close, you know, nuclear families. And there is no, you know, relationship between different people within the family. And that is what is, again, very detrimental. Whereas if you have social connections, it helps. Looking at the, you know, uh, the, we looked at earlier the blue zones. In the blue zones, you can find that even in Okinawa, there are five people together from a Maori. So if from the younger age, there are five friends they meet every day whatever they do whatever their job is job is the five of them meet every day exchange information ex and you know it's just helping each other and that community we are after all a social animal we cannot live independently and as in the modern world we are living independently and that is causing difficulties so when someone hugs someone maybe in a church or even in any you know you have an informal cognitive behavior therapy that is going on at this point now, even in my own case, this is me and my daughter, you know, her Talita, she's 30 years of age. She's a disabled girl. She's on a wheelchair. Now, she gives me the purpose in life. And I, you know, share a great love with her. And yes, you, I, I wouldn't wish a, a friend of mine or anyone to have a disabled daughter. No, I don't wish that. But I cannot, I couldn't have had a better gift from God. Rather, you know, this, my, my daughter is the best gift that I've got from God and gives me a purpose in life. And that is important. The Ikigai, to have a purpose, to have a social relationship is important. Last, avoid substance abuse. There are a lot of deaths from, you know, I don't need to tell you, from alcohol and from tobacco. And that needs to stop. This is a big causal factor. Causes Alcohol causes more than 60 medical conditions. And we need to avoid. Yes, a little bit may be okay. But the difficulty is no one can take a little bit and they exceed the amounts that they take. And that is where the, you know, the problems occur. So it is, we were fighting with antigens, but now we got a new enemy and that is the anthropogens. And this is man-made and we have to fight that new enemy. And it's important that we get the role of the patient because what in, previously in conventional medicine, the patient was minimally informed, but now the patient is an active collaborator and we need their help and together we need to succeed. So that is why sometimes shared medical appointments are necessary. When there is shared medical appointments, Anne will you know, inspire Dorothy, Dorothy will inspire Graham, Graham will inspire Donald, and that is how they get better. They're inspiring, leading better life and having less chronic diseases. But 
important is as doctors how do we motivate we need them to motivate we need to motivate them to take up imp, you know good life choices and how can we motivate now uh, you know men think we have a good aim and actually that is not true men don't have a good aim just because we got a tool doesn't mean we got a good aim and the research done in netherlands airport showed that actually cleaning the men's urinals cost more than cleaning the women's urinals men were on their phones and because they were on the phones they were peeing all over so then what did netherlands airport do to increase or to decrease cost of cleaning they decided that they will put a small you know image of a fly an inverted fly on the urinal as soon as the man saw this inverted fly he had a target they were not looking at the phone they were peeing on to this uh, you know fly and suddenly the cost of cleaning in netherlands airport decreased by 80% as soon as they put the inverted fly so that is the power of motivation of that fly we need to find that fly in our life how can we motivate our patients now recently i was very fortunate and so the six uh, you know uh, uh, pillars of lifestyle medicine is physical activity restorative sleep healthy eating uh, healthy eating decreased stress positive relationship and avoid i was very fortunate i was uh, selected as the best uh, teacher uh, teacher of the year award in 2023 by liverpool university and this is me and my beautiful wife now how did I, I it's not i'm an orthopedic surgeon and they will say people will say orthopedic surgeons are very thick people who do internal medicine may be clever then how among all my other colleagues who are internal medicine and other specialities i became the best teacher the only way i can say is because i inspired my students i would start the class give them always a positive feedback oh you are amazing you're brilliant you're a genius by doing that we are encouraging them and they did well and it is just a simple words it doesn't cost me to smile at them it doesn't cost me to be nice to them it doesn't cost me to appreciate them but by doing that they are doing the very best we are being professional in our you know in our day to day life as doctors but are we inspiring them enough are we motivating our patients so it's important thing is we need to smile we need to motivate even a simple thing as saying i'll be with you in your journey yes the journey may not be easy and it may be detrimental in the at mortality may occur but just by saying i will be with you in your journey makes a big difference and that is what we need to do if you can give a feedback there is a url here you can give a feedback but i leave it to vidya if we you know want to, if she is taking a feedback you know elsewhere that is fine too thank you very much uh, vidya and the rest should i stop sharing ah uh, yes you can Uh, thank you, George, for that uh, wonderful talk. And uh, you were like bang on time. You gave extra three minutes for uh, discussion. Uh, over to you, Dr. Vijay Bose. Uh, parts of these you had already covered uh, in your uh, series, but uh, today was uh, a, a different kind of uh, packaging, if I might say so. So over to you, Dr. Vijay Bose. Yeah, thanks, George. That was very good, uh, very concise and uh, thing. So uh, you know this um, uh, we uh, come from communicable diseases. We've gone to how to manage non-communicable diseases. But the real point is, uh, unfortunately, in medical school curriculum, we are not taught about uh, health. You know, eating, exercise, and all that. And it is um, you know somebody uh, uh, talk. You know, a patient asks you. You know, when you say do exercise and eat well, they ask you what exercise to do. Most doctors don't know what to what to say and what to eat. They just say don't eat much. Cut your portions by half. that is the primitive knowledge that they have uh, whereas you know it's, it's similar to something like you know an oncologist uh, telling you know you need chemotherapy but i don't know what drug to use i don't know what dose to use but i just know that you need chemotherapy i mean that would be quite inadequate for a patient so that's the so i think uh, we had to move towards uh, you know with efforts like this to move towards a, a curriculum for medical school so that they can be taught about you know uh, not just saying you know you shouldn't be unhealthy but how to be healthy you know so that's the i think the way forward i think and uh, i've seen many of my batch people are in this uh, program so we are putting together a, a manual for that and hopefully that would uh, help along the way thanks george thanks very much it was very insightful thank so, uh, you vijay no i, I come 
I completely agree that uh, it has to come from, you know, the where we are doing it from med medical school and we need to teach them, you know, simple things like nutrition because nutrition is very important and how much hours of nutrition education did we get in our medical school? Maybe nothing, you know. So it is important that we are doing those things and majority of the medical you know, knowledge that we gain, even if you look at any journal, even now to publish in a journal, you need, you know, thousands of dollars before your article will be accepted. So unless you have money, unless there's a big farmer, so big pharma is able to publish. Whereas, you know, if you do exercises and bet, get better, no one is there to sponsor you to publish that article. And that is where the difficulty comes. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Akila, uh, would you like to say something now? Um, Can you just give me one second? Let me just... Uh, yeah, just, uh, George, my... you could try logging off and logging in again. Meanwhile, I think. Uh, okay, one second. Try yeah. That? You yeah, okay, try I'll that? just try that. Yeah, one yeah. minute. Yeah. 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 Akila, your uh, video is off. Audio and video is off. Yeah, that was a wonderful yeah. question by Dr. George. And uh, I perfectly agree with the last thing that he said motivate and inspire. So that's what we need to do as lifestyle uh, you know, physicians. Uh, we need to do more of talking and rather than treating. And then this is the last thing. I mean, this is what I tell my patients. I said, 80% of the efforts is made by you. The 20%, we will be there with you. And we join hands in this journey. And that's what, uh, you know, helps them uh, also to sustain what they're doing. You know, sustainability is a very big question. We can talk a lot and tell them, this is what you do, 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 do. But how do you help them sustain? And how you know, encourage them to come back to you. That's a big thing that we do. So we need to be with, uh, you know, the uh, uh, you can't call them patients because we are in the journey of not making them patients. So, you know, we call them Mr. Mrs. So we tell them that we are with you on this journey. And that's one thing. And I also like the way that George uh, told, told about this anthropogens. You know, how to deal with this anthropogens is a big question. So that is not, a uh, you know, going to be an easy task. It's a big collective task. Uh, so the other thing is, of course, like he said, everyone has to have a purpose in life. You know, that is what keeps you driving. So that purpose also, we need to talk to the uh, people who come in search of you. And then you tell them, okay, this is, there's something that you need to do. Uh, in your life and this is what it is. So Dr. George, one question I wanted to ask you is, how, how uh, do you agree? See, most of the times when we talk to patients about, you know, you got uh, declared diabetes or hypertension, they immediately say, okay, no, so what? My father had this, my mother had this. So what do you say when I say that our genes are not our destiny? It is important for us to say that these diseases can are potentially reversible if they change their lifestyle habits. Even type 2 diabetes is completely reversible. Now, what people think, and we have gotten to the uh, idea that you, if you have diabetes initially, it is tablets, then it is uh, injections, and that is it. But that is not the case. We know that people who have diabetes have an increased risk of from, you know, death. So it is important that they understand that. And they also understand that it is an achievable goal. Now, uh, uh, say for instance, um, so that's why shared medical appointments, I think, are the way ahead. With shared medical appointments, when there are six people in the room, or what happens is Dorothy will inspire Gerald, Gerald will inspire, you know, Dennis. And that is the power of a group shared medical appointment is significant. So even in a group of six patients who are diabetic, one of them says, actually, I've reversed my diabetes. It inspires the others to say, well, I'm going to try that. If he has done it, I'm going to do it. And that is why shared medical appointments. Otherwise, you're only expecting the doctor to do all the talking. So it is important that they take on the ownership. Out of six, you will find at least one person who's going to do it. And then it is like an infection. It spreads from one to the other. And they're all becoming diabetic dynamic in their approach towards the disease because you we can't we can't we can't keep everyone giving insulin and that's no end to it or we can't give you know um any such intervention, you know, there is a finite limit. What we need to do is to prevent those diseases. And we need to have not a premature death, a mature death. You know, when after the age of 75 or after the age of 80 or 90, have a happy death, not prematurely die from heart attack or, you know, that's what is happening. 
Yeah, so that's uh, what it, we uh, we say that you know genetics loads the gun, but it's the lifestyle that pulls the triggers. So very it's true. A very common scenario that we see in India that most of them don't seem to have any uh, genetic history of their lifestyle disorders, but still they are. So you know that's when the anthropogens are uh, in uh, play. Uh, so the I only want to say uh, that there are two mantras for life. One is moderation and discipline. That's what uh, we need to believe and we need to spread the word. And we also need to be the change that we want to, you know, the world to see. I did see one of the comments in uh, the chat saying that, yes, I do advise my patients, but I don't follow that. There's some doctor who had confessed uh, very honestly saying that, yes, because most of us, you know, uh, we preach, but how well do we practice? So that's very important. And I think all the change should come from us. So I believe that even when, you know, uh, in the clinic, we can put up a small boat saying that, okay, uh, I did my health check on this time. This is what my uh, latest sugar levels are, or this is what uh, my visceral fat is. You know, you could just put a small thing in your clinic table and that could inspire your patients. Yeah, no, very true. Uh, I, I, my, most of my patients have back pain uh, and uh, they come to me with back spine you know, and they may be young and they have back pain. And I'm now 60 years of age. And I don't know whether if you see my website, uh, you know, I do the plank and I can, for a man, I uh, say that a forward plank, uh, you know, you have to do a forward plank for 120 seconds. So I do a forward plank in front of them. They have done only 10 seconds and they have stopped and I do for 120 seconds. And then they feel, then I ask them, who's older? you or me and then they get the message that you know they feel that just because they got a vertebral column and disc in the middle they should be able to stand without any difficulty it is not it's the muscles that make us stand and it's only the strength in the muscles and even for old people you know they think that they can just sit down sedentariness increases sarcopenia the problem is again the big pharma you know the, there is no tablet for you know sarcopenia if there was a tablet for sarcopenia the big pharma would be promoting sarcopenia and everyone would be ha taking a tablet for sarcopenia it's only exercise that prevents sarcopenia so yes there is no a person making money but it's important that we are able to pass on that message but the world is changing i mean let's not look at it negatively the world is changing we are making huge strides lifestyle medicine there is a lifestyle medicine society in india there's you know even in the uk we are conference bslm the british society of lifestyle medicine conferences next year uh, sorry next week and we have about 1200 members will be you know uh, coming for the conference so it is it is a speciality that is improving last year i went to the American Society of Lifestyle Medicine, amazing, big conference. I know it's getting bigger and bigger and people are understanding that we need to have better lifestyle cho choices to have a better health. Yeah, thank you, George. Uh, we have Lalita, who's an entrepreneur, health coach and a registered dietitian uh, logged in from the United States. Uh, Lalita, would you like to add something? Uh, thank you very much, Vidya. First of all, Dr. George, um, very commendable uh, presentation. I think uh, you've encapsulated the entire aspects of lifestyle management uh, so beautifully in the time given. Uh, very, very commendable and a lot of uh, great pointers that you brought in. And I love the fact that you brought uh, the, the simplicity of our poop being a smaller poop. Uh, you know, connected to the to the hospital, which is so critical. Um, I started off uh, getting my education in clinical nutrition about 20 years ago uh, from Wayne State University here in the U.S. But of course, having a background with um, a little bit of the Indian descent and uh, the Ayurveda and everything, my mind still wandered to go back to uh, holistic well-being, and that's when I became an integral um, or an integrative uh, health coach. So the way I treat patients, or I should say treat people, um, as uh, Akila said so precisely, is not so much to look at the symptoms that they're currently experiencing, but also looking at the root cause of everything that happens around. And I think in lifestyle management, where you've put it so very well in terms of emotional well-being, social well-being, spiritual well-being, physical well-being and mental well-being. These are my five important aspects that I focus on. And I'm a big, um, you know, big uh, 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 focus on, I uh, put, put on gut health because I think gut is your second brain, which is very, very critical at this point. 
and everything that boils down to what you put into your system um, and, and that entire feeling of what they say, you, you think through your gut and your gut feeling is your probably your best sense of engagement with the audience. I think that's so important. Everything boils down to your microbiomes and the, the, you know, the billion bacteria or the microbiomes that you have in your body. If you're able to nourish that and if you're able to keep that active, I think majority of the lifestyle diseases can certainly be succumbed. Um, yes, it is true that we are moving on to a better stage of, uh, you know, uh, medicine, uh, but I still feel majority of medicine practice today is reactive medicine, not proactive medicine. And if we are able to completely engage into proactive medicine, we engage with our and uh, even before we make them patients and teach them wellness and empower them in all sense to take charge of their well-being before they come and see you, then that's probably the best way. And one last, uh, you know, quote I would definitely want to say is that, yes, I've worked with uh, at least, uh, you know, 10 senior nephrologists and about uh, four diabetologists all through my life. And Certainly this whole engagement about dietary recommendation was pushed on to my shelf, right? It was always, I will give the insulin, you talk about how much um, carbohydrates they can eat. If that switch can be done early on and that education can be provided by the nephrologist himself or by the diabetologist himself or her, I think that engagement is important. And also educating in India, if I may say so rightly, in educate, educating the nurses with nutrition lessons is very critical because I think the nurses probably engage with the patients a lot more than it is able to provide time. So that's probably another way of um, you know, conveying that education and providing that education insightfully. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lalita. Well said. I completely agree with whatever you say. Yeah, thank you. And someone also in the comment has said that your statement, genetics loads the gun, but lifestyle puts the, pulls the trigger. That's an amazing statement. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, uh, Dr. Vijay or Dr. Um, Akila, would you like to take the uh, things on the chat? Because uh, George won't be able to see all the uh, messages because he logged out and came back. Okay, so Tulip says, would like to know Dr. George's experience with his patients, uh, people, uh, long-term acceptance. Uh, what uh, is your experience of long-term acceptance of uh, your... Uh, the... Uh, uh, the uh, I treat mainly, I'm an orthopedic surgeon, so it is hip, knee, back, and neck pain. It is compliance is less, but the when we the, the the in my NHS practice, compliance may be less than in my private practice. In my private practice, the patient who comes to see me has already known what I deliver, and he wants that rubber stamp. He wants to follow lifestyle medicine. So he sees my website and comes and searches me. That is why there is a 90% compliance in my private setter. But in my NHS patients, that compliance is not there because I just get the average, everyone, and you know there are so many factors i mean i they're they're all i mean everyone needs help i'm not denying it they need the right help i try to inspire them but the compliance is more difficult in the nhs setup uh, you know in the you know in the public sector it's much more difficult but people want to get better people want to get better but even a small word you know what i find is even a small word i am with you in your journey we will walk together that makes a big difference. You know, we sit actually, you know, it has become, you know, I feel we have all become so hard hearted. We become very professional. Uh, you know, when you go on the road, I try, tend to smile on people around me. Now, even in a hospital, we all work in the same hospital. There are staff within the same hospital. I smile at someone else. They don't return the smile. It looks as if, you know, if you smile, you become weak. You become a weakling. What is wrong in smiling? You're just passing on some happiness to the next person. That person is passing on some happen happiness. Even that is curative. That makes us better. You know, but unfortunately, we have, you know, we want to be as grim face as possible, you know, and unfortunately, in orthopedics, that is even more important. You have to be as tough as possible. That's only when you become an orthopedic surgeon. So we need to change that culture. We need to change that culture. Yeah, perfectly agree, uh, Dr. Uh, George. So, the, you know, uh, as the patient leaves your clinic, it's just enough if you put an arm around his shoulder or a pat on the back and say, don't worry, we are there. And, you know, we walk the journey together. I think it makes a lot of people uh, help them to sustain the 
uh, you know, uh, advice that we give. Yeah. And giving them little but often, and I know you can do it. I have faith in you. It doesn't cost me one penny to say these words. I have faith in you. You can do it doesn't cost me anything gives me more you know private practice than what i would expect but just these little words make it better so there's this question uh, on uh, what's your take on collagen consumption for protection against bone loss <laughs> no my uh, the only way to prevent bone loss is to exercise weight bearing exercises weight bearing exercises will increase the osteoblast and that is the only way you can increase bone there is all these are snake oils. There are many, many of these drugs are just snake oils. So, you know, it comes, there is a, you know, parabola, like the Scots parabola, they become very important for, you know, uh, imp for a few months and then it disappears out of the market, you know. Uh, so, Dr. George, that was my question and that was uh, precisely why I wanted you to kind of give a confirmation on that and, and a validation on that because, uh, where we are in the U.S., there is a one retail store called store called Costco, uh, where you get all your things in bulk. And today, as I see, the aisles are built um, so humongously to have tubs and tubs of coconut oil, big containers of turmeric, big containers of collagen, and that's um, we are a biggie size country. I mean, so we we like to consume everything in big sizes, but unfortunately, I feel that the public is not able to kind of moderate it or, or control it at, at many times where they go, um, you know, they go overboard on all of these things that kind of come new in the market and, and anything to do with turmeric or anything to do with uh, coconut oil, even though it's a saturated fat, it's kind of become, you know, um, uh, uh, just a new hype, right? So once it becomes a hype, the 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 it goes in a rampant uh, rage. So that is really why I wanted to kind of get an insight from you as a surgeon about how important collagen is. Uh, yes, it probably does help a little bit with the wear and tear, but not so much as much as what you precisely said for exercise. So I do tell my um, clients, you can have. Drink all the collagen you want, but if you're not moving your uh, tush, there's nothing that's going to happen. <laughs> Benefit, yeah. <laughs> yes, sir, uh, there is some, sorry, there's somebody logged in as ADMD13 with a lot of comments. Uh, if you wish, you could unmute and speak once George has uh, uh, finished responding to Lalita. Sorry, I forgot what I was going to respond to. <laughs> no, it's, the diet so anyway, is very yeah. important. There is no doubt diet is important. But diet needs to be what we have eaten for thousands of years, not the diet that uh, Walmart or Tesco is giving us today. We need the diet that our you know, forefathers ate. Vegetables, carrots, peas, you know, uh, br uh, brinjal, you know, egg, those are the things, celery, those are the things that we need to eat, not in packets, food packets. So I asked, one of the questions I asked my patients is, out of 50% of your food, how much is packets from the supermarket? How much is prepared at home from fresh ingredients? If it's prepared from home from fresh ingredients, that is good. Culinary, you know, it's good because that is good food. Whereas if it is from a supermarket, you know, shelf, then obviously and it is a prepared food, then obviously there are a lot of preservatives and that causes the dysbiosis because that will kill the microbiome that Lalita was talking. That kills the microbiome. Whereas if you eat, you know, ordinary, you know, sweet potatoes, um, you know, uh, peas, uh, carrots, that will encourage, the fiber will encourage the microbiome. And as everyone said, you know, that is the second brain, the gut brain axis. There's a big, and there's such a wide area of contact between the exterior and the interior in the gut. So it is important. What we eat is very, very important. Uh, Dr. Rajkumar has his hand up. Uh, would you like to unmute and speak, Dr. Rajkumar? Hi. Yes. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Jaj. And I would like to thank Dr. Vijay Bose for sending me the link. And uh, we both, I'm also an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, it was a very good talk. Uh, uh, two questions. First question, I want to know whether you are a vegetarian or a non-vegetarian. Uh, and my second question is, and you said about uh, uh, this animal protein and we don't need animal protein at all. Um, it's always uh, vegetarians say this and non-vegetarians say no, no, animal protein is very important. So uh, your take on this, this is what I just wanted to know. 
Yeah, I I am mostly a vegetarian. Occasionally, I take meat. I take only chicken and fish if I have to take. But majority of my food is just vegetarian meat, vegetarian food. Okay. Now, coming to what is the next question you asked? No, regarding this uh, animal protein and uh, uh, plant-based protein, and you said the animal protein is not actually needed. Uh, so yes, there is no there is evidence to suggest that you can from plant-based you can get adequate proteins. There is a there is a research study which they did. They took some seniors who were having sarcopenia. They gave them animal proteins. They gave them vegetable proteins, and both of the groups improved their protein content or the muscle mass. So there is no difference that one protein is superior to the other. I can add to that, yeah. So um, the uh, this is a debate has been going on for a long time. Uh, the animal protein is certainly an easier way to uh, to meet your protein needs. Now we know that we need more and more protein, especially if you want to build on muscle, that you need more protein. Two advantages of animal protein is that the bioavailability is more. So you got to take a lot more uh, plant protein if you want to have an equal amount of protein. That's number one. Number two is the the, uh, the fatty acids in the um, animal protein, whatever you eat, whether it's chicken or, uh, you know, mutton or whatever, it comes from muscle. So that's what you are eating the protein for. So that gives you the ready-made uh, fatty acids, whereas in, uh, in the, um, uh, sorry, the, the amino acids, whereas in the plant protein, you need to have a selection of different proteins. Just one tofu, for example, will not give you all the amino acids. So you need to have a wide variety to meet these requirements of amino acids. So, uh, to put it uh, in, a, in short, uh, animal protein is the easiest way to access uh, the protein, but can be done. So many vegetarians are very healthy, but they need to take in a lot more effort. But I think we are looking at it very narrowly there, because if you take animal proteins like this, I tell my patients this, if I take a burger from McDonald's, it's on a brioche bun, and there is a burger in the center, it is so good that I absorb everything, and nothing goes to my microbiome. It is like me in my family. I earn money, come, and I only I eat. I don't give my wife and kids the food. That's exactly what happens. If I eat a McDonald's burger, it is yes, it'll give me the proteins, but it won't give feed the microbiome. It is important that feeding the microbiome. When I take, you know, peas, when I take beans, when I take carrots, when I take spinach, then the fiber, the bran, there is enough food for the, the fiber for the microbiome and that is very very important yeah Just fiber is a different uh, topic yeah you need fiber suddenly for it and that's the reason why uh, you know whole grains and things can't get digested in your upper uh, GI tract and they're covered with this so that they can go to the microbiome so microbiome feeding the microbiome is so crucial but uh, meeting the protein requirements is a slightly uh, different topic yeah sorry yeah, Lalita may have a take on this yeah. yeah, just one more thing I wanted to add was with regards to the biological value of the protein. For example, egg is the classic standard for a high biological and a purely fully uh, contained amino acid protein. It's got all the essential 22 essential amino acids that we need. But as if you are a vegetarian, Dr. Rajkumar, to be specific to your question, you can still get all your amino acids, your essential amino acids, uh, compared to the non-essential amino acids, if you are able to complement the requirement of your diet with pulses, with grains, with lentils, and with all of those fruits and vegetables that you get, even though the, the protein does not come predominantly from fruits and vegetables, the gathered effect of all of these, the mixture of all of that is really what complements your requirement of a protein a day. For an average person who's about 60 kilos, he needs about 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight of protein. So just estimating that if he's an active, active person, he requires about 60 grams of protein a day. But, but today, the way protein is being in a way kind of um, overused or, or abused, I would say that the consumption has become a lot more. So the thermogenesis actually causes a lot more concerns to the body. So animal protein is fantastic. If you are used in the Western world, probably that's the first source of protein that they reach out to. But there is a lean protein versus you know fatty protein that you don't want to consume and lean meat versus other meats that you want to, the, the, the cuts of the steak. But as far as a vegetarian is concerned, you do not need to become a non-vegetarian or an animal protein consumer in order to get all your protein. You can still very well be a vegetarian and consume all that protein that you need for a day and be physically active. 
thanks thanks a lot uh, and just a, a quick uh, last question uh, it, to your patients how many eggs you recommend in a week because that is again a debate whether to eat egg every day or not so what is the yeah, that's, recommendation that, that's like the french paradox right i mean yeah. is egg good for you or not and if it gives you the cholesterol so the 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 ideal thing is if you do want to do two egg whites a day that's perfectly all right if if you want to do two egg whites and one yolk every other day that's perfectly all right um it, and it's not so much the uh, yolk that causes your cholesterol to go up and it's actually they have shown it with classic studies very well proven studies that it's more of the saturated fat so if you are uh, in need of good quality high biological value protein i would say a egg a day just like an apple a day would be perfectly all right thank you thank you um, so I, i can just add one thing so you know it's very difficult like uh, uh, to say uh, how many eggs will your patients need because each patient's requirement is different i think we don't have those sort of diet charts now saying that this is what it is standard for patients i think we need to sit with each person separately understand their requirement it's also important to understand the economics of the patient that's very important you can't you know uh, prescribe the same diet to more, almost uh, all the patients and i i believe that when you talk about proteins fats and carbohydrates it's more important to know what to eat how to eat and when to eat that's what we need to educate our uh, you know patients about so when you come to proteins i think it's also important the way that you make the proteins whether you add the fats to that and you know the eggs are good without the toast but eggs are good with the butter so that's you know that's the way you talk to your patients and educate them on these small things are very important uh there is a question from dr rajiv tiwari if somebody though it's not exactly today's topic what is the concept of gluten free diet for non celiacs uh, though any of you want to take that question uh that's another big concern today uh having gluten especially with the gmo foods and the, the way wheat's grown today i think that's one of the biggest concern they have done a lot of studies both in the west and the east um and uh, we are looking at a lot of products that are coming gluten free and that is probably an you know a requirement for the food and drug association to even state gluten free where it is required um i i do see that a majority of the allergy concerns um and a lot of the gi problems can crop up with um gluten um allergies and a non gluten allergy people if you are just being more careful it just shows your sensitivity it's just a trial and error as dr akila said today nutrition is so personalized and it has to be that way and it wasn't that way um as i was telling you when i was a clinical nutrition in the hospitals it was always a cookie cutter type a uh, type diet where you just calculate 1200 calories 1400 calories and 1800 calories today that's not the case we are not treating our clients with just cookie cutter type diet charts that we feed out to them we are looking at their profile what they eat on a regular basis what are their root and where their identity is and especially if there is like an asian indian descent who is living in the united states doesn't mean he or she would completely switch over to something which is completely foreign to them right i mean even though they're eating it for 20 years they they're not going to completely switch over to a quinoa based diet when they're eating rice all their life so this is something which is very critical that you have to check your body listen to your body cues understand what your body tells you from peri- uh, time to time and if there are any concerns then go back to see which of the foods that are causing that so a journaling is probably a good way to understand that but for non um, gluten um, you know allergies i don't think there should be a concern if you are tolerating it well enough you can continue it but in the process if you are seeing any gi concerns or any other concerns then you may want to go back to see if that's caused because of gluten products uh thank you lalita for the confirmation and uh, uh if anyone else wishes to unmute and speak uh, uh, please feel free uh, otherwise uh, most of the comments uh, i think we have addressed most of the chat uh, things um yeah there's one question on compliance yeah so see compliance is not i mean it becomes once you get into it it becomes a habit 
see if uh, someone can bag the price in the you know amongst the systems for the most well behaved i think it's the gut you know so you it listens to you very well you need to train that and i know where the fear comes from you know the moment we talk to uh, patients about food and diet you know you can see that uh, the expression changes and they you know oh my am i not going to be eating at all that's not the thing we actually have to sit with them patiently like lalita said and make it customized for them but we also give them allowances we give them cheating times we tell them don't worry you can go go to a party you can dine well but we also have to teach them that something called as a calorie exchange that they eat well today but they can always look after themselves better tomorrow so there are lots of small things that we can talk to our uh, patients about and you know encourage them to you know go on and keep them sustained so compliance is not a very difficult thing and it will certainly become a habit over the time uh, thank you lalita uh, george you uh, anything that you could not include in your talk and would like to add now we, we do no. have some time no i am seeing some of the comments by pandian natrajan and i think he has given very uh, relevant comments yeah alcohol is a very truth it is a carcinogen i don't think there is any safe limit at all so alcohol shouldn't be but some of the you know alcohol has become a part of the human culture and that is why occasionally alcohol is uh, you know uh, used and also he mentions about uh, in a pure vegetarian diet what is very true the only supplement you require is vitamin b12 so so even in uh, gorillas uh, if you have gorillas in uh, uh, captivity when they are given uh, hygienized uh, vegetables that is washed vegetables they lose the b12 but actually in the forest gorillas don't need that b12 because when the fruits fall onto the ground the saprophytes in the soil provide the b12 so actually if we also eat the fruit that has fallen on the ground which mixed with sand and obviously that will also improve our microbiome you know uh we live because of such a healthy we want to clean everything with detol and alcohol and we don't get the you know the real uh, input into a microbiome so fruits that are fallen on the ground which has got a bit of soil saprophytes will also help us so i do agree uh, you know the only supplement the vegetarian the vegan needs uh, is the vitamin b12 uh, then there were uh, just one more thing i mean i am an orthopedic surgeon just can i just share one thing yeah i just share this is a new project that i have i don't know whether you can see it. there's a new project that i have started my self help so there are free exercises for back pain hip pain knee pain and neck pain so you can share this and you can see me doing the exercises so if you click on back pain you go to youtube and you can see me doing these exercises that are uh, you know sorry it's still in the initial stages so all of you can pass on this information to your patients uh, it's a free resource that is available so for back pain preventing hip arthritis preventing knee arthritis neck pain so if anyone wants to so it's called my self my hyphen self hyphen help dot org dot uk thank you very much yeah that's all i wanted to say yeah yeah so george uh, most of the comments that uh, you probably missed when you logged out is just i mean everyone appreciated your uh, talk they found it useful and uh, uh, you know they are very happy with the way you have uh, answered the questions and um, uh, so I, they, some i i did uh, ask the person I, because there's no name there's some uh, thing who has uh, you know posted a lot of uh, comments about yoga and pranayam and uh, and think so uh, do you want to put in a word about that sorry 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 yoga i don't have I mean, yoga is good but i don't have any direct knowledge of uh, yoga nor do i is anyone else maybe better at you know talking of yoga i do uh, you know uh, recommend patients to for back pain patients to practice yoga and that does there's a lot of evidence that says that it helps but i personally don't practice yoga so i wouldn't know Doc, dr uh, vijay boss would you like to uh, come in here this uh... Uh, yeah um so i mean uh, yoga is one form of you know your yeah, flexibility and mobility is very important and of course uh, yoga is a lot more than just exercises it is you know it's breathing it's, uh, it's living and all that um so it's a very comprehensive method and so it's a very direct tool for you to you know, incorporate a lot of things uh, that's really beneficial so if somebody could adopt uh, you know yoga it's, it's very good in multiple friends 
the um, apart from this the one thing that i wanted to add before we finish is that you know most of the audience here are doctors and it is very surprising that you know the health indices uh, amongst the population the, all the health indices the worst health indices are the doctors you know whether you take in terms of hypertension diabetes heart disease or whatever which is really a paradox yeah. because we are supposed to be the experts in health but we have and you know the uh, the lifespan of doctors all over the world you know is the, is the compared to the average population is the is much lower than the average population and things like that it really uh, really a paradox but i think the time has come for us to you know have a, a rethink about this and uh, we should uh, address that issue at the at the very core level so uh, you know george your talk was very useful in that uh, in that sense and i think as all doctors we must uh, change our, uh, our orientation to more fundamental not, not just you know you know eating this or that but you know more fundamental approach so that uh, you know you know the health uh, we have a completely different uh, view of health Thank you, yeah, Doctor Vijay no, Bose. Uh, um, Doctor Pandian Natarajan, you wanted to say something, sir. I, I presume iPhone is you, Doctor Pandian. No, no, iPhone is not me, but I gave my comment, and I think Doctor Jaj responded to it about a okay. vegan diet requiring only B12, and about why are we still serving alcohol, knowing it's a carcinogen in our conferences. Medical conference yeah. is saying alcohol is a <laughs> oxymoron. Oxymoron. Uh, yeah. So, so Dr. Rajkumar, as uh, you said, we had more than eighty participants. I'd like to tell you, we had more than one hundred participants. So, uh, A D M D thirteen, uh, you have your hand up. Uh, would you like to unmute and speak? Whoever is logged in as A D M D thirteen, would you like to speak? Your hand is up. iPhone please go ahead i don't know who you are i uh, iphone your hand is up with with yeah this is radha here how are you hi uh, hi so hi, uh, i was i was able to log in today um uh, i i'm from the us i'm with yes uh, co resident of jipmer anesthesiologist too so i was the one that put on the chat that um my friend who was my classmate from medical school became a vegan is a family practice physician and he has been um, asking me to go vegan i try i gave up everything i gave up milk ghee butter everything but yogurt is something just that one few teaspoons of yogurt at night is something i'm having a hard time giving up and he says it's all in the mind it's probably in the mind i will try and um, recently for the last Three or four months, I started doing intermittent fasting because some of my friends, my colleagues, are huge on that. So they gave me a lot of information. Started doing intermittent fasting. That I can vouch on. Really, really has given me more mental clarity. Even though I did not eat anything less during the non-fasting window, I just ate whatever I eat. I'm a vegetarian, by the way. Uh, I've even stopped eating eggs and stuff recently, and um, I lost eight pounds in three months without any major effort, and I I feel lighter. My gut seems to feel better. I've never had any major gut problems anyway, and um, just my mental clarity seems to be better. Anybody have any experience on intermittent fasting? I try to do the sixteen eight, and sometimes it's hard as an anesthesiologist. So I forgive myself if I do fourteen ten or. Fifteen nine or whatever, uh, but I try to keep my eating window uh, within eight hour, eight to ten hours max, and that has hugely helped me in hydrating myself at during the uh, fasting window with black coffee, black tea, um, <clears throat> you know, sparkling water, plain water, warm water seems to help better. So I don't know if anybody has any experience on intermittent fasting. I did not first believe in it. because i thought i'm a vegetarian i eat so little anyway but i feel like this intermittent fasting has uh, helped me i think of it more like a vrat and if that day is sashti or kriti hai or something like that it even helps me better so <laughs> makes me feel more accountable so i don't know what anybody's experience is yeah i i gave a entire uh, this marvelous medicine session on intermittent fasting i i spoke on an entire session on that so there are a lot of nuances to uh, intermittent fasting 
the first thing is you know uh, people think intermittent fasting is something that was discovered in the us 10 years ago but you know fasting has been going on in india for uh, thousands of years really so uh, the term knowledge itself is you know it's uh, you know it's fasting has been then so the, the most important point is you've gone to a, a, a lifestyle of eating constantly snacking which is very wrong of course so we need to uh, eat uh, at less uh, frequent intervals that's the number one thing and then losing weight rapidly may not be a great thing you know we want to lose fat and we don't want to lose uh, muscle that's very important that a lot of people initially get very enthused by losing weight but you may be losing muscle so it's very nuanced it's a lot big topic uh, so for everyone for su- suppose you know you have a you know a low fat percentage body f- fat percentage is very low and then if you you know suddenly somebody told you intermittent fasting 16 hours and then what you're really use, uh, losing is uh, is actually muscle which is very bad for you so you got to tune it to what is uh, you know suitable for you but the one uh, you know take away message is that uh, uh, frequent eating or snacking you know every all the time that we are used to that's certainly wrong thing to do and a minimum a minimum of 12 hours is mandatory for everyone without exception including diabetics you need to have, give your uh, system a rest for minimum 12 hours and whether you extend it to 14 hours 16 hours 8 hours will depend on so many other factors with very nuanced uh, most important factor would be your body fat percentage and things like that so enter uh, talk on um, fasting really but everyone should fast for a minimum of uh, 12 hours no there is sorry, a lot of i missed evidence. your thing on intermittent fasting sorry yeah okay. uh, so radha i will send you the i mean the playlist and you can go through the uh, go through that talk once again but uh, I, I definitely many of my acquaintances and friends and lot of people are on it and they swear by it and they seem to be feeling very good about it there have been lot of questions about recording of this session it it may not be available to you immediately but uh, if you uh, on youtube if you uh, look at uh, learning gen surgery the uh, the uh, our parent uh, organization is learning gen surgery which is a facebook group which has more than 40000 uh, members from across the globe so marvelous medicine is an activity of facebook uh, group uh, learning gen surgery learning gen surgery has a youtube channel and uh, in that we have a playlist for marvelous medicine so uh, i will uh, i don't know how e- each of you got this link some of them i sent uh, directly some of you have got it through somebody else but what i can do is uh, share the link to the playlist for marvelous medicine which is on uh, the learning gel surgery youtube channel and this recording i'm sure with the tremendous response that it has had uh, patta radhakrishnan will make a special effort to try and Uh, upload it earlier we are a bit behind we have completed more than 140 episodes but i think we just have about uh, 100 plus uh, up there uh, we'll work on that and get it through but uh, we'll definitely make this session available as uh, soon as possible is that okay with you uh, radha krishna yeah yes vidya yeah so uh i if, uh, so if, i think uh, almost everyone has had their uh, a word and um, a real me eight when upset with gi tract restricted diet intake may improve the health like fasting okay a lot of lot of comments about food and exercise and uh, uh, meditation and yoga and uh, so uh, we've had a very engaged audience today thank uh, thanks everyone one last chance admd 13 if you want to speak please uh, go ahead unmute yourself i can see your hand up but uh, uh, i cannot uh, Uh, your hand is up but you're free to unmute and speak hello can you hear me now yes 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 i am dr ashok oh, bade this is dr bade okay i i oh. i couldn't recognize you because of the admd 13 please go ahead dr bade see this uh, lot of evidence is available that we can prevent diseases we can prevent mortality by doing pranayama breathing exercises yoga meditation and i think we have to just find out the evidences it is already there age old practice of indian uh, in our civilization we have seen that it, it it prevents most of the diseases i have some example known to me who had uh, whose diabetes was diagnosed at that time blood sugar was 300 plus and glycosylated hemoglobin was 13 and you will not believe within one and half months without taking any medicine just lifestyle change meditation pranayam yoga 
and walking. That is all. Now the, the blood glycosylated uh, hemoglobin for next last one or two years, it is around seven to six, and uh, the person doesn't have any problem. So I think uh, we keep on talking about molecules and all this. I think best is our old civilization concepts. We have to eat. So we have to eat sattvic food. We have to meditate. We have to do pranayama. We have to do yoga and regular dietary habits. We don't have to bother about which molecule we are eating, which antigen we are eating, or which uh, antigen we are responding. If you do this, I think uh, uh, it is quite good and prevents a lot of diseases and deaths. Even I also practice yoga and meditation to some extent. And I do think it is very, very important and helpful. And I think we should promote it to everybody, not only to doctors, but to our patients also, rather than telling them so many other things. That is, of course, my opinion. You may like uh, agree or not agree. Thank you, Vidya. Uh, thank you for your comments, sir. Uh, do any of you want to respond to that? No, I think uh, we agree completely what, uh, you know, Dr. Bade said. Uh, it's, but it, you, I, I don't know whether he mentioned diet, but diet is very important. And uh, yeah, uh, as, I said, no, sattvic food is diet only. Okay, okay, fine. Okay. And uh, like Vijay said, we need to give uh, the gut a rest. So eight hours of, you know, 16, eight and in the olden traditional was you only eat when there is sunlight, you don't eat when the sun goes down. So they were doing a, you know, 16, eight fast, you know, as soon as the sun went down, you stopped eating. And only when the sun came up, you would eat. So, you know, that was naturally practiced. But once we had artificial light, we started midnight dinners and eating throughout and that there, there is no rest for the gut. It is important that we rest the gut. And there is a lot of evidence that fasting actually, because it is the glucose that uh, triggers uh, cancer, even there is some evidence that fasting will help during chemotherapy, fasting will help during cancer therapy, because uh, uh, if you run, the ketones becomes the fuel and the glucose is not the fuel. For cancer cells, it needs the glucose. It, so it cannot survive on ketone, uh, you know, and that is why it helps in cancer also. Actually, if you take two meals without breakfast and without evening snacks, that is all what will give us a good health. That is all uh, uh, like they are in our uh, uh, traditions. Two meals, no, but the, morning meal and evening meal. That's all. Yeah, no, I agree. But the practical difficulty is uh, some other lady was saying, I don't know, her name is Radha, I think. You know, when yeah. you're a doctor to eat, just sometimes it becomes, I mean, it needs a lot of, um, you know, uh, you know, resilience and, you know, perseverance to, you know, have that uh, mindset yeah, yeah. to just have, you know, one or two meals. It is, it is not easy. And we must empathize with our patients. We must empathize with ourselves also. It is not easy, but it's a, it is a thing that we need to do. And unfortunately, having fast food and, um, you know, uh, Walmart yeah, yeah. around the corner, then you try to consume more. That's the problem. <laughs> but best is home food. If you are yeah, able best to is home food. No, no, no. I don't deny that. I don't deny that yeah. at all. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Radha, God. And Radha thank Radha, you. Can you can, can you just help by posting the link to join uh, Learning Journal Surgery Facebook group? I am I am finding it a little difficult. I can you just uh, post the link to join the Facebook group Learning Journal Surgery? There uh, somebody has asked for it. So meanwhile, I have posted the link for the playlist of Marvelous Medicine. Uh, uh, it will have whatever has been uploaded and it will, the, you can, uh, as uh, the future recordings get uploaded, it will be available. So uh, there you go. So um, Radha Krishna, uh, over to you. We have three minutes left. <laughs> no, actually, watching and uh, hearing George after so many years has been really wonderful and that's it. Brilliant lecture, I should say, because uh, more than 100 uh, logged in. I think it's one of those record uh, uh, webinars, I should say. But what amuses me, Vidya, is, you know, the torch bearers, the path breakers, uh, um, promoting wellness medicine, orthopedic surgeons. As an undergraduate, I see the orthopedic surgeons, the most bawdy, most boisterous, noisy, you know, the maximum alcohol the is consumed by them. The speciality that anesthetists hate the most. <laughs> you know, see, 
actually when the the orthopedic girls are partying girls are really scared to go anywhere nearby you know and that is and these people i don't know what happened to them that they have uh, mutated they mutated <laughs> anyway having said that see i think uh, Sadly, uh, George, we are all actually, actually we are all at the checkout time now, hotel checkout time, <laughs> and you know almost everybody attending this uh, this meeting or checkout time, the check-in people are not there, as Vijay Bose uh, rightly says. I think the check-in people should hear this. What is the point in our listening to this and you know trying to adopt newer uh, technologies which have now been adopted all this while? You know, we we're all people. When the physicians keep sitting for hours and surgeons keep standing for hours, we strain ourselves, especially uh, you know our, our breed of minimal access surgeons using you know very very new technologies in very odd positions. I think we are straining ourselves like hell, and uh, there's a sad thing about it. And then you know. Having spent time with uh, talking to people all through the day, you don't want to see any human being or talk to any, even including your spouse, at the end of the day, and definitely not during weekends. And all that we do during weekends is eat, 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 and drink, drink, drink when we're all together. I mean, it's just the antithesis of what you spoke, uh, George, till now. It's, it's, it's very sad, but that's what happens all the while, you know. It's a wonderful lecture, I think, and the comments and uh, uh, moderation is all very great. But of course, uh, uh, Vijay Bose, we, we work together and then he walks the talk and you know he maintains all that. It's very nice to see that and he, he, his interest in uh, lifestyle medicine is wonderful. But my only question to both the all the faculty is uh, what is the role of uh, you know a spirituality because in your six uh, uh, leaves you put the, the seventh one maybe a spirituality because you see most people at certain uh, point of time they go towards god and you know does it have any effect on health positive health and it does should it become a part of a story Definitely, definitely. There's no doubt about it. When I was in my medical school, I was an atheist, but now I'm a theist. I firmly believe in God. Now, I'll tell you, sorry, I don't know. I don't know whether we have time. We are running out of time. I don't know. There is no scientific evidence to prove or disprove that God exists. But if I know there is a friend there who will help me, that gives me a lot of positivity. And that is how religion helps. Now, all these communities, the uh, all the five communities which we looked at, uh, the uh, where you know the uh, centenarians, where blue zones are, they all believe in uh, spirituality. There is we do not know how to disprove whether there is no God. What is there if I just believe there is God? That no, God no, will no. help me improves our positivity. Uh, so yeah. I want to add. Yes, Sorry. Akila. Yes, Akila. Uh, so even in spirituality, there should be some moderation. You know, too much of that also is not good. So when you find a purpose, a calling, that you can call it a spirituality. So even um, uh, even in that spirituality, there should be a moderation. Uh, I also wanted to say that, uh, you know, in lifestyle, as uh, physicians practicing lifestyle uh, uh, medicine, uh, we uh, should tell the patients that we are not magicians. We don't have the magic wand and we say that, okay, overnight or within three months, you can get better. There is a way we do it and it takes time. And I like, again, I want to emphasize on the uh, very nice point that George made that it is that we are here to motivate them and certainly tell them that we are on this journey with you. But how long that journey we do, that is for, you know, uh, the patients to decide. And uh, uh, so we tell them that we are not here as magicians. So I just wanted to say, George, it so happened that uh, Radha Krishna and a few of us were wa watching the Netflix uh, thing on uh, Blue Zone just uh, last weekend. And that was the first thing you spoke about when you started the talk. Like, so, uh, right. so we were, it was a pretty interesting, uh, interesting series it was. So, uh, so each one of you, your uh, closing comments, please. Uh, uh, George, you can be the last. So, uh, uh, Lalitha, Dr. Vijay, Akla, and uh, George, in that order, please. So, one thing I did want to share is this is something that I keep handy every time in my uh, my desk, Ikigai, uh, which is a, definitely a very good way of connecting to spirituality. As uh, Do Dr. Uh, Radha Krishnan so rightly said, many people seek the path of spirituality, especially after a certain age. We kind of uh, lean on to our religion or lean on to a belief system, and it's perfectly all right to do so. Uh, to me, 
spirituality is something that you do with passion and with respect and anything that brings in respect for your own self and that brings in that um, that grounding that you love yourself and that you respect yourself for who you are and what you are will lead you on to a better lifestyle and um, a better engagement with yourself. And uh, to me, for example, my biggest spirituality is dance and music. So each person connects to their spirituality in different ways. Some connect through religion, others connect through passions. And as long as you have that grounding, and um, Akila, I think earlier also said, if you have a motivation of doing something in your life, you have that drive all through. All these people in the blue zones are definitely people, centenarians who had a drive to do something what they want to do all through their life. And that's what kept them alive too and well. So um, wonderful session. I think it's been great to share a great platform with Dr. George and so many you know, senior doctors here. Uh, thank you so much for including me, Vidya. Yeah. Akila, next. Oh. Uh, so I still want to maintain that these are the, the two mantras for a good lifestyle is moderation and discipline, uh, except on the substance abuse. Uh, the rest of the other five, I think uh, if we have a moderation and a discipline, I think certainly we can help uh, ourselves have a good lifestyle and help our patients as well. Um, so that's what I want to uh, convey through this. And uh, thanks to Vidya and Radha Krishna for, uh, you know, uh, you know, making me a part of this wonderful discussion, and it was wonderful meeting all of you. Thank you. Um, uh, so, thanks for the program, Vidya and uh, Pata. Uh, it was a very insightful program. So, answering Pata's question, you know, regarding spirituality. So, uh, religion and spirituality are quite different. So, religion is one of the tools of spirituality. Just like you know, you have Ayurveda and Siddha as uh, tools of medicine. Each religion is one of the tools which is a ready-made tool for you to follow. But the spirituality is completely different. As Ralita said, you know, it's completely different. It's how you connect the soul to the universe and other souls. So little different things there. Now, uh, this, um, uh, you know, coming to lifestyle medicine, um, some of my batchmates are here. I could see Sashi, Venangupal there, Madhavi is there, a few others are there. So they're all putting together a manual of, uh, you know, we have all these uh, textbooks on diseases. You know, we have thousands of them. But there's really no comprehensive book on health. What to define health? What you know? What really is health that we're talking about? And so we are all a collective effort. Nearly uh, 40, 50 of us are uh, putting together, and it soon be ready. And I hope that uh, it will be really useful for everybody um, as a as a tool uh, to pursue and get healthy for yourself as well as your patients. Thanks very much for the opportunity, Vidya and Pata. Good. Excellent presentation. No doubt you got best teachers award. Excellent present, a hidden talent from George. <laughs> I am Dr. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you. Special thanks to Vidya and Pata. And I tell you, the energy that Vidya has is just amazing. I wish I had one tenth of that energy. And we had a fantastic panel in Akila, Lalitha, and Vijay. I'm so grateful. Uh, you know, and uh, and all, everyone who contributed to the discussion, it was just amazing. I learned a lot from this and uh, hope to meet up with all of you sometime and or in the uh, marvelous medicine in this group. And, you know, thank you once and for all and have a good evening. Be inspired and inspire. Be kind. Let us motivate our patients. Bye bye. Uh, thanks, George, for, uh, you know, agreeing to join the session when it's bang in the middle of your working day. And uh, thanks, Lalita. You must have had to get up early to uh, log in. Uh, and um, thank you, Dr. Vijay uh, Bose, for uh, sticking with uh, Marvelous Medicine for um, now. I think it's over a year since your talk happened. So probably it's time for you to plan another one. Yeah. So I will get back to you on that. And uh, thank you, Akila, for being a more active participant this time than uh, usually you're logged in and uh, listening. And thank you to all the hundred odd people who logged in today. And uh, most of the people were, uh, you know, very um, active and there were a lot of question answers and a lot of discussion. And uh, Dada Krishna has promised to uh, upload the edited video as soon as possible. So I will, I will share the, uh, the link uh, through the same channels that I sh shared the uh, invitation for today's meeting. And I will hope that it reaches, uh, reaches each one of you through the path that the uh, poster and thing took. So. Uh, there have been a lot of uh, comments about the poster. I just wanted to repeat again. Every one of these posters is uh, made by Radha Krishna week after week. 
Uh, and uh, so somebody even asked me today whether we are using AI to make the poster. So uh, um, uh, Radha Krishna recently attended a uh, you know meeting, whole day meeting on AI in medicine. So maybe he started using, I don't know. Um, so we hope to see you all again next week with uh, another episode of Marvelous Medicine. And um, till then, take care and stay safe. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.